So I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, me, which is something I don't feel particularly comfortable doing, but we'll see how we go. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, biotech industry and what it is and what makes a good biotech company. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what makes a good entrepreneur in our industry. And, um, and I'm, then I'm going to talk about my experience with Karis, which, uh, which I was there right at the very beginning with Karis, a spin out from university here, right up until uh, May of this year, when I went on to do other things. And um, I, looking out, I have to say, all of you look hopelessly young, which means, by contrast, I must look hopelessly old. And just to prove it, uh, my first slide is really going to tell you uh, a little bit about um, my background. And I thought this was better than writing down my CV. So I was born in 1963. For those of you, most of you here were born uh, in about 1990-ish, a bit more, perhaps. So let me put it in context. You've got to think dinosaurs, Vikings, Henry VIII, Two World Wars, Simon. Okay, and that's roughly where I am in the time scale. And um, my first lab position came at a pharmaceutical company called GD Searle. And I was there about four weeks when they said they were going to close the place down. So that was really interesting. I managed to stay on for another year and a half. Went back and did a PhD and a postdoc. I did that up at Loughborough. Uh, got my first management position at the end of that. Did a part-time MBA. Then got my first business development position and that was at uh, Porton Down. That was my first experience of coming this far down south. That's near Salisbury. Then I went over to work with the Active Biotech Group in Sweden. I spun out a company here uh, called Isogenica, which is still going, going well in Cambridge. Um, sold a company of theirs uh, to a Norwegian company. And after a while, decided to go and work in Belgium uh, uh, to a company that makes antibodies from camels and llamas. I was told that I was completely mad in doing that, so, um, but that turned out really well for me. And then in 2006, actually early 2006, I took my first CEO position here uh, at Karis, which came out of the university here. And that all came to a, to a, to a halt earlier this year. And, and now I'm at an investment company called Advent. Uh, it's my first partner position, my first non-executive director positions, and my first position as chairman of, of, of two companies. So, so that's my, my little story, and, and, and why did I put it like that? Because it helps me see how these things take a long time. So I've spent, I've spent just under half my life in education. So, okay, just under half my life in work. Um, seven years of my life working outside the UK, in Sweden, Belgium, and 20% of my life at Karis. That's a huge proportion of my life. Now, the good news is, you know, providing that I don't go senile and can't recognize my family, I should be going for another 20 years in this industry. So um, that's really good because in, in biotech and in pharma, you, you, don't, you don't worry. If, if, you're, if you're 30, you're still young. You're still too young, you know. You've got to do your PhD and your postdoc and all that kind of stuff. So it's a huge learning experience and it takes a long time. You lot won't take as long because you've had the benefit of people like me who have taken too long and you can learn the lessons. But it, 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 is, a, it is a long process. So what's a biotech company? Well, um, the textbook answer, okay, it's an innovative small to medium sized company, normally with no sales and no profits, that uses its unique biological insights, coupled to uh, intellectual property, that's patents, to create innovative therapeutics, diagnostics, medical devices and research tools. So um, the reality of biotech is that it's a cash hungry monster that grows slowly and needs constant feeding with increasing amounts of money uh, until it's eventually consumed by an even larger and hungrier monster. A successful investor would look at this and say, my biotech company, they're a team of magicians. They can produce successful drugs much more quickly and much more cheaply than the more experienced and cash-rich pharmaceutical companies. And they can do that whilst ignoring the failure rates that, um, the, of the pharma industry. And the failure rates in our industry are, are huge. So, Every 10,000 molecules that are found in the lab, one gets to market. Every one, that, every one that gets to market, only one in three are commercially successful. So the failure rates are huge. And finally, the unsuccessful investor. He sees biotech as an effective and entirely legal mechanism by which a large fortune can be converted over a period of many years into a much smaller one. And, and we encountered this a lot when we were trying to raise money, particularly from high net worth individuals, people have come to me and say, Simon, sounds really great, but um, I invested in a biotech once. It took me 12 years to lose my money. So, 
what makes a successful biotech company? And I'm going to talk mainly about therapeutics because that's my experience. So most successful biotech companies don't do what big pharmaceutical companies do because the bad news is that big pharmaceutical companies are really good at what they do and they've got more money than you've got and they're more experienced. So, and, and, and there's this myth going around that, that biotech companies, because they're small and responsive and young and funky, um, you know, they're, they're really efficient and they're really super slick. But uh, Michael Porter, the um, economist, uh, gave a, a lecture in 2000 with some work that he did that showed that actually there's no difference in the efficiency of biotech and big pharma because biotech did more things, but pharma made fewer mistakes. So the net output was, was, was about the same. So what have you got to have as a biotech? You've got to have something that pharma doesn't have. And that starts with unique insights, something that you know that somebody else doesn't. And, and that's usually around biology or, or, or clinical uh, application. So, uh, you know, the, the, the pitch we heard just now was really a good understanding of the clinical application of something very simple. You need the right people, you need the right experience, skills and mindsets, really important. So, and you need to think about who you want as your employees, the people who are going to rally around you every day, and who you want as advisors. And we'll come to that in a moment when we talk about Karis. If you're a drug, you want to be the first to market with something or the best. And usually the first is much better than the best because it's really hard. You know, I, I see a lot of people come and say, Do you know, I've just developed this new idea for a new drug and it's going to be much safer than the one that's been at market for 10 years. Well, imagine how long, how much you've got to do to prove your drug is safer than the one that's been at market for 10 years. It's going to cost you hundreds of millions and take too long. And you've got to be back that up with the right uh, patents and business plan advisors, etc., etc. And you've got to remember that resources are scarce. So there are many good biotech ideas. Well, I see loads of ideas. And I think, wow, that's a good idea. And there are loads of them. And there are loads of really brilliant and talented people. But the resources, particularly the money that you need to develop those ideas, that's scarce, those resources. There are many more good ideas than there is the money to fund them. And the human talent that you need to manage that money and that idea well, that's even rarer. So the scarcity of resources in our industry is not ideas, but it's money and people. And timing is everything. So, um, you, you know, if you came up today with the best replacement to aspirin, no one would be interested to the best replacement for aspirin because everyone's using aspirin. But if you could come up with something that's a small improvement on the big hot topic in cancer at the moment is CAR-T therapy, then, then, then you'd, have, you'd, have a, a big, you'd have a big win on your hands. If you'd come up with some idea in CAR-T cancer therapy five years ago, you'd have been too far ahead of your time. So time means everything in this industry, as it is everywhere else, I guess. So what doesn't make a successful entrepreneur? You recognize all these people, okay? So, um, so here's the, um, uh, this is my, uh, this is my um, dirty little secret. I love watching this program because the people are so stupid. And um, they make me laugh so much. In, in no other endeavour could you, you know, be doing something for two or three years then claim to be an expert at it. Yet, you know, someone who sold mobile phones for five years suddenly is a business guru, you know. And, uh, but that's not what business is. That's what good entrepreneurs in our, in our industry don't look like um, people on The Apprentice. They also don't look like people who just lose their rag. Okay? I mean, here's good old, good old Gordon. And... Uh, 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 and he's um, going um, ape at someone for doing something relatively minor, no doubt. But we're not like that either. Uh, we're certainly not like these guys. Um, they all look a bit boring and they talk nonsense. But, but you see the guys come and pitch there. They've got their crazy ideas. The guy who got an electric thing to cook an egg that never worked, you know. And, and we're certainly not good salesmen either. And, and uh, some of you may remember the Fast Show. I might be a bit young, but who knows. But what does? Okay. Well, the first thing I learned when I became a CEO was there's no magic dust for CEOs. All the CEOs I worked for, I thought were somehow sprinkled with magic dust. And they had some kind of wisdom that I didn't have, you know, that perhaps... But there isn't any. CEOs and entrepreneurs are just ordinary people. I was a very ordinary person once before I became an entrepreneur and a CEO. I don't think it's in the genes. I really believe that entrepreneurs in our sector are made, not born. So um, I don't think you have to have been to. You've got the right parents who are entrepreneurs, your grandparents who are entrepreneurs. doesn't matter. Is it something to do with upbringing? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, 
The people I see have successful in my industry that I work in come from the whole spectrum of society, from, from, uh, from the privileged right down to the impoverished, and, 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 it, and I don't think it's got anything to do with upbringing. In fact, a lot of us, like me, went into science in the first place, not just because we love science, but because it was a way of getting out of a boring uh, manual job and a, and a career doing something really uninteresting. So, so um, you know, your upbringing's got nothing to do with that. What about education? Well, you know, you're going to a good university here, so you're, you're, you're the lucky ones. But beyond a good understanding of science, the school and university you went to are not important. You don't need that to succeed. I would say there are a few things which I think are really uncommon in, uh, in, in the terms of entrepreneurs, which biotech entrepreneurs do really well. They're usually scientists first, so there aren't many marketing people that make it as a biotech entrepreneur. There aren't many finance people that make it as a biotech entrepreneur. Not many lawyers, loads of scientists. They're all reasonably intelligent and able to learn quickly, and that's what you've got to be able to do. And they're thoughtful and pragmatic. And I'll go back a slide. How many of those people look thoughtful and pragmatic? Not, not many. So I'm going to talk about Karras now. Karras was a 2005 Southampton spin-out. Uh, I wasn't there right at the very beginning. That money was raised by three um, academics who are here. Uh, Paul Townsend, uh, Graham Packham and Ganesan. Graham's still here at the School of Medicine. They'd raised three quarters of a million pounds of seed money to make analogues of this compound. Now, any chemists in the room? Chemists? Chemists? Yeah. Fancy making that? It's a dog. This looks, this looks like the, your, your first day of, of lecturing on ChemDraw. It's just awful. But, um, but Gannison thought he'd found a way of making it synthetically and making analogues of it. And if you can do that, then he thought that you could make a drug. So, that's, that, that's not one of those, but that's, that's uh, someone tearing their hair out. So, um, we didn't have anybody who looked like that on our team. When I arrived in May 2006, um, half the seed money had been spent. I don't know how they'd done it, but they'd spent half of it. They got no compounds to test, no data. They couldn't even make that first compound, romidepsin. There were four staff, three therapeutic programs. Can you believe it? The science was being directed by the founders. They had no place to call their own, so the chemistry was still being done in chemistry. The biology was still being done over at the hospital. Uh, and, and I sat in the, um, what was called the Center for Innovation and something. Center, yeah, Center for Something and Innovation. It was the least innovative place I've ever worked, but it's called the Centre for Enterprise and Innovation. And the company was really far too early stage when it got money. It's just an idea. So, uh, so the first thing we did was we throttled back on all the spending. So um, we, we, I, I told the guys that, you know, great enthusiasm, three programmes, but you can only do one. And we begged and borrowed from anybody who would do work for us. So we used to go to, to people who could do experiments for us, suppliers and CROs, and, and talk to them about... Um, you know, getting them interested in what we were doing. And then they'd say, yes, we can do that for you, Simon, that's great. And I'd say, great, can you do it for nothing? And some of them said yes, okay. Enough of them said yes. And some of them said, yeah, we'll do it. You can pay us when you've got some money. And one of them, like the data that we generated so much, actually invested £50,000 of his own money in the company. So we really did, we were really on a shoestring. We focused on what we needed to get the investment we made some compounds, we got some in vivo data, and we recruited a chairman that I'll talk about later. We spoke to more than 50 institutional investors, that's uh, VCs and other kinds of investors, really nice people, nice lunch, you know, good coffee, really, um, you know, really like the technology, like the people, but they weren't interested at that stage. And, and we spoke to several corporate partners, people who would perhaps take, take on um, our technology and pay us for it. And all the big pharmaceutical companies weren't interested because it was too early stage. But we got heads of terms from three smaller companies, one in Italy, one out on, in, in the Bay Area at San Francisco, and one in, in Heidelberg. And that's when somebody very important joined us, that was our chairman, Drummond. And um, he, uh, he came to us in the autumn of 2006. We recruited him, because we're all scientists, we took a really logical approach to getting our chairman. So, um, 
we, we sort of said, yeah, we wanted someone who got experience as a chairman in the life science, who'd raised money, got lots of friends in the city that could help us, blah, blah, blah. And um, so we set up a, 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 a sheet of things. Key on that list was we had to work with a recruiter that, um, that wasn't going to charge us any money because we didn't have any to pay a recruiter. We found one of those. And, um, and we met five or six chairmen that ticked all the boxes, but they weren't right. They weren't the right person. We didn't feel that they were the, engaged with us enough. But we met, we met Drummond here, who was just right, but he didn't tick any of the boxes. Okay, so he just left Novartis as the ex, uh, chief executive of Novartis UK. He got over 30 years global pharma experience, but he'd never been a chairman, never worked in biotech, never raised any money, and he had no friends in the city. But he was a great mentor, and he was a vital part of the story, and I'll tell you why. So what made Drummond a good mentor? Well, um, he didn't try and turn me into a mini version of himself, which was really good, because I could no longer be like Drummond that he could be like me. Uh, he never once tried to tell me what to do or what not to do, which is, which is great. And he never once reminded me of how successful he'd been. What he did do was he used his experience to guide and encourage. He allowed me to almost make mistakes. So rather than telling me not to do something, he'd let me go ahead until I almost made a mistake and then stopped me. But most importantly, he helped me succeed and helped Karis succeed. But he never took the credit for it. So, so that, to me, is, is a top guy. And I still keep in contact with Drummond. He, he left the company as chairman in 2012 when we raised our venture capital round. But he's a good guy. So after a year, I've been with the company. We've managed to control the money. We've got our first compounds. We've got our first data. Uh, and I say, including the experiment that nearly killed us, we pinned all our hopes on, a, on, a, on, a, on an in vivo experiment that was being done over Christmas in 2006 into 2007. And it failed spectacularly. But it, it failed because um, we had different technicians, one who worked on it before Christmas and one who worked on it after Christmas, and the data was all over the place. And we thought that was the end. We had the heads of terms from three smaller companies, but we had no investor interest, and we were running out of money. IP Venture Funds, who were originally investor in us, they, they, they'd said that they'd commit 25% of any money that we raised. But of course, 25% of nothing is, well, you don't need to be a mathematician. And that's when Drummond stepped up to the plate. And his, him and his former colleagues at Novartis put their hand into their own pocket. And we raised just under a million when we had just less than a month of money left in the bank. So, so Drummond turned out to be a really good decision in the end because he put his own money in. That allowed us to grow. We signed the deal with an Italian company called EOS. That gave us another million of research funding in, in the first year. And the idea was we'd, we'd take this program to the clinic, sell it to a pharma company and share the revenue. We generated much more data but still kept a tight rein on spending. We recruited a bigger team. So we recruited Steve as, as head of research and uh, five more scientists and Justine who did pretty much everything that wasn't in the lab. And uh, things seem to be looking good. You know, first company I've been CEO of and we'd raised a little bit of money. We still kept looking for a larger investment and still kept talking to the people who liked us but weren't interested. But we found one that was interested and wanted to put two million into us. But the terms were so onerous that we, we turned them down in the end. And, um, but, but it was all symptomatic. When you can turn an investment down, you think, wow, things must be going well. Then came the global financial crisis of 2008, which um, which, uh, which, you may, uh, which you may remember. We spoke to lots more institutional investors. Nice people, very polite, good lunch, good coffee, no interest. And now we are running out of money much more quickly than before because we've got more people and we were doing more things. Financial crisis happened. We had one last chance. We went to speak at a, a, an investor event. Uh, and it's a bit like a Dragon's Den type of event at London Business Angel Network. And we were told, you know, go there, you pitch. You're going to have 100 people there in the room. You'll speak to 20. Expect to get investment from 10. You know, we thought, fantastic. Well, we turned up. It was just after the collapse of um, Northern Rock and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, th and there were 30 people in the room. And 20 of them I knew because they were giving pitches as well. And they were all their friends. And some of them were the organizers. So I thought, this is a disaster. 
And, uh, and I remember standing there, and the other guys that were pitching, there's a guy who got a new kind of cork for wine bottles, somebody who did entertainment at halftime in Premiership grounds, somebody who did some kind of whizzy social network thing, which I, I don't think he, even he understood, somebody found a new way of bending metal, you know, and there's me stands up and starts talking about HDAC inhibitors for, for inflammation. You know, I thought this, I remember standing there thinking, well, we've given it a good run, but this is the end. And, um, and it nearly was. We did actually manage to raise um, some money from these guys, but the real big break came with a massive stroke of luck that we had. We'd been talking earlier in the year to uh, the Bank of Scotland about they had an angel co-investment co fund. And uh, they said, thank you very much, but we're not going to invest because you're a biotech company and we'll lose all our money and we'll have animal rights protesters outside our banks. But, you know, good luck. And in, in November, they came to us and said, we're about to merge. We're about to merge with um, Halifax. And we've got to spend the allocated money that we've got left in this fund. It's £250,000. You're the only company that's looking for £250,000. And um, you'll have to get it matched by angels. And can you get it done by Christmas? So we said, yes, yes, we can. And we did. So we raised just over a million at the height of the, of the um, financial crisis. And uh, that saved us from, from disappearing. We, we, we had about a week of money left when that happened. So that was, that was good. So, so then the next year, it got a bit more challenging. So our only corporate partner walked away from the deal. The technology we had from the university was interesting, but commercially challenging. We shrank the team. But we had a plan B. Steve, who by then we'd made our CSO, had two great ideas the year before. And he managed to skunk work these two, to two programs with interesting data. And, and the first few compounds he made were potent and selective and had all the things we were looking for. Spoke to more investors who continued to be polite and to ply us with lovely coffee but wouldn't give us any money. By the time we got to 2011, we were ready to give up. The two new programs were moving forward but we were forever running out of money. We call that prostate financing. It comes in small drips and it's very painful. And we'd raised money through convertible debt as well to try and get people to invest. It was really hard. And, uh, and, and then on Good Friday, I was driving up to Scotland with my wife. It was just before the royal wedding of Will and Kate and we wanted to get as far away from London as possible. Uh, and Scotland seemed a good idea. And I spent the first two hours of the journey saying to my wife, I said, well, you know, we've given it a good go, but just have to prepare for the worst now. We've got about a couple of months left in the bank and it's all going to go. But by mid-morning, everything had changed. So we, we got to a service station just north of Birmingham, picked up, my, picked up my iPhone, looked at my email, two emails in there. One was from a large pharmaceutical company. We want to do a deal with you. The second was from an investor. We want to invest in you. And that was, the, that was the day that everything changed. So 2011 became a balancing act. We couldn't do both. We had to do either do the, the pharma deal or the VC investment. We were still running out of money. We persuaded our angels to put in a little bit more. Justine, who we'd recruited back in 2007, put some of her own money in. I put some more money in. Drummond put some more money in. And by, the, by the, about this time in 2011, we had a very attractive pharmaceutical deal on the table. It was going to be a total deal value of around $450 million, uh, with an upfront of about 10 to 20. And because, our, because we were smart, we even managed to charge the pharma company some money while they negotiated with us. And the investment terms were also good. But what we didn't know at the time was in November of 2011, the pharma company pulled out of the deal because they weren't going to do cancer anymore, which was a big thing for them. And then we raised a major round in 2012. We raised about 25 million from three of the biggest UK biotech, in, it was the third biggest UK biotech investment that year from three leading global VCs. Uh, and uh, that really set us on a path. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So from 2012 onwards, we could really hit the accelerator. We could really move the company forward. The VC investment was the turning point. Both programs accelerated, we grew the team. And then we had to learn how to spend money because we'd, you know, we'd been really tight with the money and then you can't do that when you've got 25 million. We moved the company to Oxford, which included some difficult decisions because most of the guys have been located down in Southampton. 
We had some early successes, but some technical setbacks too. And, um, and two years ago, almost exactly to the day, we signed a collaboration with the world's largest cancer hospital, the MD Anderson Cancer Center um, in Houston, which um, last month was, was called Houston Under the Water. Um, and, um, and, and that's a fantastic place, and they, and they did our clinical trials, done clinical trials. So where we are today uh, with Caris is that, that they've got two programs in the clinic. We did that with a staff of 18 people, which is about 15 to 16 full-time equivalents, and a virtual development team. But you have to be careful what you wish for, because um, uh, at the beginning of this year, the, the board of Caris saw that the company had moved to uh, become successful, and as companies move on, they want a different CEO. So that was my, my opportunity to leave and, and start with Advent. So that's Karis, and that's our story. What did we learn? You have, to, you have to understand what's unique about your company and have a clear vision of how you can make it successful. You've got to be pragmatic all the time. We had plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and we often relied on plan W, X, and Y, because you can't just go single-mindedly with one idea and follow it through to conclusion. You've got to build the right team. That doesn't mean getting the best people. You can't afford to get the best people when you're a biotech company. You can get them as advisors. You can, might get them for an hour or two a month or something, but you can't have them on your, on, your, on your team. Look after the cash like it's your own. Do the best science you can afford. When the science goes wrong, and it will, because it always does, do it quickly and cheaply. That was a good thing. When we failed with the university asset, it only cost um, our investors about £2 million, so that was, that was terrific. We did it quickly and cheaply. Get a good mentor and learn to be resilient through the tough times and be relentless in your pursuit of partners and investors. And keep an open mind and recognise luck when you see it. All is carrots. That's the kind of story. Well, it wasn't a fairy tale, that's for sure. Never felt like a fairy tale. Hard work. It wasn't a how-to-do-it story either. I hope you never have to go through what Karis went through. But if you have a part of it and you learn something and you, and you keep going through one obstacle, then, then that's great. But it's not a how-to story. It's not really about luck either. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you know, we, it's not like we did nothing and then suddenly things landed on our plate. That would be luck. And, and none of us are geniuses, right? Okay. It also wasn't the worst journey in the world. Okay. Nobody died. We didn't lose our leader, left in a tent somewhere on the South Pole. You should read this book. Okay, absolutely Cherry Garrard's an accidental scientist. He, got, he was um, part of the landed gentry that got bored and joined the scientific team for the fated Scots um, uh, Antarctic expedition. And he hated every minute of it. And um, he wrote uh, this book. Well, he didn't write it. Uh, his, his next door neighbor wrote it. It was a guy called George Bernard Shaw. Uh, wrote, this, wrote this story. Um, which he originally wanted to call To Hell with Scott, right, which has obviously two meanings. Um, but he eventually called it The Worst Journey in the World. And it's a fantastic story of how things uh, were planned badly, got worse, uh, and then ended up tragically. So um, uh, it's, a good, it's a good book, though, honestly. And, and it wasn't an epic either, OK? So it wasn't, this story isn't an epic, because people do much bigger, bigger things than Karis Therapeutics. I mean, we, yeah, OK, we raised uh, 30 odd million pounds. We're still going. But it's, it's, it's not an epic. So what kind of story is it? I said it's not a training manual. It's not even a success yet, because we haven't got a drug to market, and we haven't persuaded a pharmaceutical company to buy Karis. That's when it'll be a success. But it is a story of resilience through challenging times. Um, it's about getting the right people at the right time, with the right plan, hard work, and a never say die attitude. We had the occasional slice of luck, getting Drummond. That was really lucky. He was around at the right time and looking for a company, and we were looking for a, a Drummond. We were lucky with the 2008 investment that um, the financial crisis was so awful that um, Bank of Scotland had to find a way of spending £250,000. We were lucky with the two, 2012 investment because we had two options on the table, and that encouraged both of them um, as we had competitive tension that we could create. And we've had two out of two of our programs through toxicology and into the clinic, which is beating the odds. For me personally, it's a story of hope for cancer patients, and that's why we all went into the industry in the first place, really, is to help people improve their lives. And with these compounds, these drugs that are in the clinic now, people who are not responding to anything else, who previously you know, were just going to get worse and die, their, their condition is improving. And, and I'm delighted that I've been a part of that story. And I hope it hasn't put you off 
to being an entrepreneur um, in, in our sector. Hopefully it's made you realise that it takes a long time. There's some pitfalls along the way, but it's been an enormous amount of fun. And, um, and I wouldn't swap it for the world. And that's it, really. So thank you very much for your time. So the question was, did the investors or the partners know that we didn't have any money? Okay. So, so the thing about the industry is, you've, you've got to pretend like you haven't got any, any, you've got to pretend like you have got enough money, whilst everyone kind of knows that you haven't. Um, so, so it's always the case with a biotech company. I've never, there are very few biotech companies that can say, you know, I don't need to raise money for, I, just, I don't need to raise money for another five years because no one tends to invest over that length of time. So you're always running out of money, so they kind of know that. But you'd never, you'd never let an investor know that you've, you've only got a month left in the bank. I mean, well, at least you'd do your best not to let them know. <laughs> that, that'd be giving your dirty secrets away, really. Okay, okay so the question was, how, how much of my time did I spend looking for money rather than actually doing the really interesting stuff, which is making the drugs. Until 2012, well, until the end of 2011, when we started negotiating the big investment, I would say I spent, me personally, I spent well over 50% of my time raising money and, and trying to do deals. And, and that went down when we raised the, the large amount of money because suddenly we had three big investors that had um, enough money to continue to support us, even if we needed a bit more. And there were a couple of occasions when we did need a bit more. They, they'd sort of they'd skulk around a bit and go, oh, I don't really know, and then they'd, and then they'd do it, you know. So, so it, it's, it's different. Once you've, once you've raised a big amount of money, it, it gets a bit different. But it takes a lot, it's a lot of time. And sometimes, the, the round we raised in 2007, the 0.85 million, that closed on a Friday, uh, a Friday um, afternoon, and on the Sunday evening, I was off to San Diego to try and raise the next round. So it just, it's relentless. It's just remorseless. If you hate traveling, if you hate talking to people, it, it, you know, just, just don't bother. Just go and do, I don't know, become a parking warden or something, or a you know, traffic warden. But, but, but you know, I, I get a great deal of buzz out of talking to people. And, and, and I love it when I, when I help this company succeed. And the companies I'm working for now, I'm working for... For, for four or five companies now. So to me, it's great fun, but it takes up an inordinate amount of your time. So the question was, how, much, how transparent was I with the staff for when we were running out of money? But net, well, yeah, it's a difficult one. We, you see, there's lots of sacrifices that I would have made before we couldn't pay staff. Okay, so um, we used to present at board meetings every month, they'd be, here's the financial plan, the money runs out here. If, if you don't pay the CEO, the money runs out here. If you don't pay the CEO and the rest of the management team, the money runs out here. So, of course, the board instantly said, oh, okay, so you've got, you've got that much runway, you know. And, and, and it never really came. There was a few times we had to give up a little bit, but um, not too much. So, but it would have had to have come to. We'd have, we'd have had a duty when, when it got, the cash got so low and we had no confidence that we'd raise any more. Even when we got down to a... When, when we raised the money with a week to go, we knew six to eight weeks before that that if we could do everything we needed to do, we'd have the money. So we didn't need to tell anybody. So um, but it's a difficult question, because generally I, I'm in favor of transparency, but, but we didn't, we didn't. The question was, did we envisage um, seven or eight years later we'd still be working on the same compounds? Well, actually, no, we didn't. We thought it happened much quicker than that. Um, but, but, but we didn't bank on how long it would take us to raise the money or how difficult that chemistry was. So that's why we, we actually ditched that program in 2009, I think it was, I said on there, um, and, and started on something that was much easier. But uh, uh, you always think, you have to think that you're going to do things much more quickly than you actually do, although you all end up taking up too much time. Because if you don't believe you're going to do things quickly, no, no one would ever invest in you. If you turn up to an investor and say, you know, uh, could you give me, you know, 20 million, but by the way, it's going to take me eight years before I even get into the clinic. You, they wouldn't even be polite. I mean, they're, they're, you'd, you'd be shown the door before you got another word out. So you have to be a little bit optimistic and, and show what can be achieved because you're going to trip over things all the time in our industry. Things are going to take longer. It's not just the money. The science sometimes doesn't work. 
we spent nine months sorting one problem out, you know, that, that we had in a, a spurious data, bit of data that we had, and just knocked the first program sideways. So it always takes longer, but I didn't know. I, th I, I was hoping when I joined that, you know, three or four years down the line would have done something wonderful, my share options would have been worth something, and then I could um, go on and do the next thing. And it didn't. It took 11 years. So The question was, did, did I have a v vision for how my own, how I might progress myself, um, and if, if this didn't work out, was I, had I got so far away from the science that, that I, I couldn't do it anymore? But, you see, that really happened to me in... in... 1990, 1992. Uh, I was so far away from the bench that I couldn't do anything really useful, and and and, and really I made a decision um, that that I quite enjoyed the management side of stuff, and and doing the MBA really that, that kind of pushed me in a direction. So um, by 1995, I'd really cast my dice. Into that, into that direction. Having said that, I don't think I could do what I did without the scientific background. That's, that's, I don't think anyone can because you need to understand a bit about what you're doing so you know what risks you're taking on board. But I, I couldn't now. I'd be like a zoo animal let out into the wild. If, if I had to do anything else than the job that I did now, it'd be useless. I, I would starve after just two days or something, get eaten by a lion or something. It'd be useless. So this is what I do. And if, if I'm no good at it, that's, that's the end. It's, it's going to be a long retirement. So. Join me to thank Simon one more time.